Two more Mondays. Doesn't change much. I still have to communicate. Do you get this? Uh, a couple things. Don't forget dice fours. That's going to be our live next week. So start thinking. Start creating your dice fours. You are free to test them outside and calculate your own fitness. Uh, as I said we're going to drop them out at the academic building. Head out there, you can see like the walkways, you can drop them down into like the atrium area. Um, it's going to be next week, extra credits online. We have also quiz, our quiz for uh, life history strategies on reproduction. So R versus K strategies, bet hedging. That sort of thing, that is, that comes up with, that's due the first of December. So you can take it now this week if you want, now that the exam's over, or you can wait until after a break, you know, start reviewing on Sunday, maybe you take Monday to study and then, then, then take a quiz. Uh, this competition quiz will likely go live on Monday and then you'll have until Wednesday to do it. So got this last quiz to do. Third, we have blood drive, tri-beta blood drive. That is on the 30th. Uh, if you donate, uh, if you get someone to donate for you, or if you go to donate and they deny you for one reason or another, uh, then bring the form, let me know, you'll get some extra credit. Uh, that extra credit's added to, what did I say? Exam two or exam three. So it'll go to either of them. It doesn't really matter which one because they're both worth the same amount uh, overall to the lecture grade. So I'm just going to see if it makes a difference. I don't think it'll make a difference if it gets added to one versus the other, but that, that's what I'll do. Whichever one can help you the most. Um, three things. Fourth, exams. I don't know if you noticed, but I posted the grades in Blackboard. Yep. What's that? They stay. So, yeah, I just look at the, so the grade replacement, final exam with one of your lowest exam grades, I base it, I, I don't look at the grades with the, the extra credit, like with the attendance extra credit or anything. I look at the raw grade and then it gets subs gets replaced and then the extra credit gets added on top of that. So, so uh, exam three grades, they are posted in Blackboard. Um, still have uh, university excused absences uh, that happen. So those will, those exams will get taken today and tomorrow. And then you'll get the actual exam and see the key, and uh, that'll get released next week. All right? But I wanted to get all of those grades posted so you can see. Uh, I also have basically the grade sheet up and running. So if you are curious where you stand, um, you know, what your goal is for the final exam, then you can come talk to me. I won't do it over email. You have to come see me. Uh, if, you're, if you're curious, you know, what do you need? To get a certain grade, I can I can do that. But you have to come talk to me. All right. Uh, grades overall weren't too bad. Uh, you, can, you can look at your grade. We'll get the get the exams back uh, next week, and then we will see if there's anything uh, any questions that, that are off. I was a little surprised at one of the lab questions. We had very few people actually get it correct, and that was the dispersion, the coefficient of dispersion, um, and our test statistics. We did allelopathy test statistics, doing a t-test. Got to remember those p-values and what those p-values mean for the exam, because you'll see it again. You just start, start reviewing, start, start looking over at the, 
the uh, lab lab stuff. Uh, speaking of the final exam, that is on that Monday of finals week, 8 a.m. Bright and early here. It is over with in two hours. All right. Um, the exam is going to be, I, I'm not going to say it's going to be twice as long, but it is longer than a regular lecture exam because it is a final. Uh, the, the point breakdown is we do have some new material. We have competition. We have the, the R versus K strategy. That's going to that's gonna make up maybe about 15%, maybe 20% of the total. Uh, and that includes that includes the lab. So allelopathy and the diaspora lab will be on, on the final exam as well. So that's kind of the new material. And then the rest, which would be about between 70 and 80%, is all review material. So start reviewing it, start looking over. Um, now I'm going to get asked, how should I study? You have the old exams. Some of you didn't pick up the old exam. Uh, I will make the actual exams, the ones that you had, available so you can come by and pick up, pick up a copy uh, along with your answer sheet if you didn't already pick them up. Uh, those will be ready next week. But what I would do is I'd go through and I would use your notes to try to answer each of those questions first. Uh, don't, look at, don't look at the answers. Try to use your notes, answer the questions, and then check the answer key. All right? Just trying to memorize answers won't necessarily work. So get into the notes. By trying to find that material in the notes, you're reviewing uh, material before and after where that answer appears in the notes. So you're studying it, and the more you do it, the more questions you try to answer, the more likely you're, you'll encounter and review the same material, not just once, but twice and three times, and maybe even four times. That is a good way to kind of get back into the notes and, and review. Uh, same thing with quizzes. Quizzes are a little bit harder. Uh, that'll take some extra, uh, extra work on your part. I don't know if... You are aware of it that when you check the key, if you're on a desktop computer or a laptop, uh, you can actually select all the text and copy and paste it into like a Word document. Then you can strip out the answers. You can kind of go through, delete it, uh, delete the answers so it's just the question and the answer choices, and then you can do the same thing with that. Uh, that's extra work for you, uh, but I think that could be something worth doing. Any questions? No? Nope. Right. Competition. So we kind of finished up populations uh, with the population strategy. And then, you know, we understand or we know that populations don't exist in isolation. They are interacting with all other populations that are out, out there. So what we can do is kind of start moving towards the community side of ecology, and that community side, one of the main ones is competition. All right, so what is competition? Competition is the interaction among individuals over a limiting resource that will result in a decrease in the population size of at least one of the species. And at least one of the species. So it's the interaction of individuals over a limiting resource. And that's going to result in a decrease in the population size of at least one of the species. It could be both, but it's at least one of them. We have two types of competition. We have interspecific competition, which is competition between different species. And we have intraspecific competition which is among individuals of the same species. And I say recall this dn over dt equation. So r times n times 1 minus n over k. Or you can write it as 1, uh, or as uh, r times n times the product k minus n over k. I can also So, zoom in on this. Right. 
we have that growth equation, that logistic growth. The reason it looks like this is because of intraspecific competition. The more individuals that we have in our population, the stronger that intraspecific competition is with each of the individuals. So you start suffering, each individual starts suffering a decrease in, in birth rates, increase in death rates, perhaps both, right? That's density dependent, inter, uh, density, de density dependent regulation. And that gets us to a carrying capacity. So this curve itself is that intraspecific competition. When we go to interspecific competition, then what we often see is a change in our birth and or death rates leading to a decrease in population size. And that decrease is due to our competition for that limiting resource. So there's only ever going to be one resource that's, that's limited. That limiting resource, if there's less available to this species, that means that's less energy that they can acquire, that they can assimilate, that they can give towards their offspring or utilize towards the production of offspring. Growth rates are going to suffer. So our, so our growth curve is going to be shifted. It's going to be flatter. It's going to take longer to reach care capacity. Not only that, but because we have less resources available to us, that means our carrying capacity is going to be lower as well. Now, we can separate between a carrying capacity and what we would call an equilibrium population size, and I think we talked about that. But the key point here is that we've got intraspecific competition. That's what's producing our logistic growth curve. Once we add our interspecific competition, now we get things shifted down to lower levels than what we would see in the absence of competition. So only one resource is limited. If we go out and we survey and study a population in a habitat, and we identify, let's do plants. Plants are easy. All right, we go out to apply grass out here on the block. Right, we decide that competition between, let's say, ragweed and burrweed is all over, all about the nitrogen that's in the soil. Right, and burrweed is winning it. We can supplement that soil with nitrogen. We can fertilize. So what we've done is basically eliminated nitrogen as being a limiting resource. Okay, we solved that one, but now something else is going to be limited. Maybe it's potassium, maybe it's phosphorus, maybe it's some other micronutrient in the soil. Key point is once we start competition, there's always going to be a limiting resource there that limits our population. Right? If it changes, something else becomes limited. But there's only ever going to be one that determines our outcome. All right, so we talked about the effect of competition on population growth rates. Well, that inherently affects our so if we introduce competition, that's going to affect our overall fitness, which means then that selection is going to favor those traits that allow our individual to acquire those limiting resources. That was the basis of Darwin's natural selection, right? Resources are limiting. We have heritable variation. Those individuals with the traits that allow them to get these limiting resources are going to be more fit. They're going to leave more offspring, and thus that trait's going to evolve in the population. So we're back to this idea of, of competition, fitness, and adaptation. So how do we demonstrate that competition is actually existing? Well, believe it or not, it can actually be rather difficult. Because it's not just competition that's taking place out in the community. We also have all the other interactions that are taking place. For example, predation, herbivory, parasitism, diseases. 
our self-regulation processes that are going on. All of those things could produce similar types of shifts in our logistic growth curve. It might look like it's competition, but it's actually something else. So if we're going to try to separate competition from these other factors, we have to first demonstrate that there is a resource that's limiting our population. And then once we identify that resource, we have to, we have to demonstrate that that limiting resource negatively affects both of our competitors, that they're both competing for that same limiting resource. So there's two things that we really have to demonstrate. There is a limiting resource and that that resource is negative or it has a negative impact. The limiting resource has a negative impact on both of our competitors. All right, so in our, our plant example, our burrow weed and our ragweed example, we have to go demonstrate that, yeah, supplementing nitrogen allows both of our plants to increase in population size. But then also we have to demonstrate that, we have to demonstrate individually that if we lower the nitrogen content, we stop fertilizing, that that's going to affect both of our populations as well. Once we do that, then we might be able to conclude that, okay, nitrogen is what these plants are competing for. And one of them is going to win out. Ready? So we have an example. And this is a classic example of competition. This was done by Joseph Connell in 1961. He studied the rocky intertidal community out in Scotland. I find, it, I find the communities fascinating, the rocky intertidal zones fascinating. We've got some on our coast, some out here in Texas. Uh, it's just, it's an interesting interesting area because you have the issues of having too much water and the issues of having not as much water because with the ebb and flow of the tides you can be either fully submerged during parts of the day you can be fully exposed during parts of the day and you have that that range in between so you have this this uh, very what i would consider a very diverse community uh, existing in this area. Not only that, but you can kind of see some of it here. When you get wave action and you get water splashing, and even with the tide, you have these pools that can form that remain isolated. It could be a, a vast community uh, of just uh, zooplankton in those areas. So it's rather fascinating. All right, so in this community, the tides and the slope, the slope of, the, of that uh, of that shoreline determines the amount of time that any part of that shoreline will be exposed to air. So if you are at low tide and below, you are 100% submerged all the time. If you are at or above the high tide mark, you're at 100% air. But in between there, you have water that, that comes up and goes down on a daily basis moves with the tides. So sometimes you'll be underwater, sometimes you won't. In this area, we have two species of barnacles that live there. Uh, these are barnacles. Uh, I believe we, you look at them at, in zoology. Is that right? No invert. Zo covers these. But with these barnacles, they are filter feeders. They're filter feeders. Outside of these shells, they will pop up. They're little, you could say, I, I think of them as uh, like peacock feathers, but they're not. All right. They extend out, they capture particles, and they bring it down into their mouth, and they feed. So filter feeders. But they are attached to the substrate. So in order for them to move, they release larvae are, they're pelagic, so they free float, 
All right. That larva, larval stage, is the dispersal stage. They settle down onto a surface where they then metamorphose and attach to the substrate, and then they're there for the rest of their life. So these barnacles have a metamorphic life cycle because we got a larva. Larval stage. They have a larval stages where their two different life life forms are specialized. All right. So we've got our feeding stage, and then the pelagic stage is our is our uh, dispersal stage. All right. And where they occur is basically random because the pelagic is free floating. When it falls wherever it lands, that's where it's going to become established. Now what? you would see in this shoreline, this rocky intertidal, is that you've got zonation that occurs. Now the zonation here, red algae, brown algae, barnacle zone, blue-green zone, these are named for algal zones uh, and what dominant organisms you would typically observe there. So you've got your red algae, your, your brown algae, your blue-green uh, blue algae up near the top. So you see this standard. Well, you've got the barnacle zone. And the barnacle zones where you often where you predominantly find your barnacles, although your barnacles also extend down all the way to the ocean, to the low tide zone and below. Now, in this area, he saw two species of barnacle. Thalamus stellatus is in our upper zone. And Balanus balanoides, which is in the lower zone. So Balanus was a, is also semi balanus present both species. All right, so here's what you see. On this zone, as we said, we have our tide area. You've got 100% air at this top, 0% air, so we're at our low tide. And then your mean tide line represents that 50-50. In the upper zone, we have thalamus. In the lower zone, we have balanus. Those are our two zones. What Joseph Connell did was go through and experimentally remove individuals from zones, from some of these zones. Because he was, he was interested. Could, if I removed thalamus, could balanus live up here? If I remove balanus, could thalamus live? lived down here. And then also, he took individuals, these balanus, and transplanted them up to thalamus to see what happens if I move them into that zone. And likewise, he took this thalamus, moved those down into the lower zone to see what would happen. Because what we're seeing here, when he goes out there, this is the end product of competition. That's what he's seeing. But you can't just say it's competition. You have to actually demonstrate it, and this is how he demonstrates it. So you've got your reciprocal transfer. What happens if I move them? Can they persist? And then the other one is, let's completely remove individuals here and see if we get colonization. All right. So he saw two different things. One, he saw the law of tolerance in action. So what is the law of tolerance? Good review. We covered that on exam one. What was the law of tolerance? Yeah, it's the bounds in which our organism can live. It sets upper and lower bounds. All right, Our organism can live within those boundaries, but outside it can't. So he actually saw the law of tolerance at work. Because balanus, this lower area, can't survive above the mean tide line. He moves them up. They can't live. They can't survive. They can't survive more than 50% air. So for balanus, they're kind of limited. They can't get to this area. They can't survive in this area just because of the law of tolerance. However, thalamus can survive below you know, more into the water. So they survive at more than 50% air, but they can also survive down here where we're less than 50% air. So they don't need this, this air requirement. They, they can do just fine underwater. So the law of tolerance is one. That's what limited balance to below the mean tide line. 
But then he also saw competition, and that competition was occurring down below the mean tide line. So why was Valinus down there? One, Valinus was down there because it couldn't survive any higher. But then number two, why is it down here, and why didn't Thalamus extend below? Because Thalamus could. If we exclude Valinus, Thalamus will extend its range down below the mean tide line. So what's going on? Well, Valinus actually excludes the other species. It excludes it from the lower species. It excludes it because there's limited space and there's the competition for space in that area. Well, how do, how do they compete? How do they win out? Well, it's the way the shells grow. So they, these things settle down under the surface and then they deposit their shells. start growing, and then they deposit their shell, and as they, as they get bigger, the shell expands. All right? It keeps getting bigger, and the shell expands that way. One of them, here's our attachment point, one of them sits up a little bit higher from the surface than the other. And this allows Balanus then, Balanus is lower, as it grows, to have its shell get just underneath the edge, the lip, of Balanus. So as it grows, it's kind of like a bottle opener that slowly pries and pops this guy off of the rocks. And instead of doing, it exposes more space for this guy to grow. So it's not just about nutrients, it's about space as well. And that's what Joseph Connell was observing. He saw that one species is limited by its ability to survive air, and then the other one was limited because of competition. So this graph kind of demonstrates it. So he did it, this was published in 61, so he was doing his study in the 50s, uh, when you removed semibalanus, which was balanus, the species, when you removed it uh, and constantly removed that species to make sure that there was adequate space, thalamus will colonize it and do just fine. But when you don't remove it, when you transplant thalamus into those zones, thalamus will slowly get in there and slowly pry over or pry up that other species of barnacles and take over that species. All right, classic example. I wouldn't be surprised if you see this on, on, on the field test, interfield test. Questions on this? All right, so that demonstrates our competition. And there's a couple different types of comp uh, competition. This is, that one was a good one uh, for exploitation competition. Well, I don't know, maybe it, it is part exploitation competition, part interference competition. But we're going to talk about types of competition, or mechanisms, I should say. So exploit exploitation competition is our competition where one species reduces the amount or availability of the limiting resource. So our barnacles, uh, Balanus is reducing the amount of space available for balance. When we have exploitation competition, it's often associated with adaptations that improve the efficiency in which you can gather those limiting resources. So you've got Plants that, that compete for water, water in the soils. So you can have you know shallow, expansive root systems right at the surface. That's an adaptation to try to get to that water as soon as it falls, as soon as it lands. That's an example of exploitation competition.
Now, when we have this competition, we don't have to have a direct interaction. Right? You don't have to be trying to get to the, that resource at the exact same time. All that matters is that you that resource is limited. When you get it, it doesn't really matter. So this is why you can have day and night foraging. And that is our, you know, we have, you know, some of you might be interested in bats. Bats compete for the limit for a food supply, right? Insect food supplies. But bats aren't the only insectivores that are out there. So while the bats are feeding at night, they are competing with all of the other insectivores that are active during the day. This is exploitation competition. All right, so the key, key thing with exploitation is, is that we want to be the first to acquire it and use it. So get it first, use it first. We can use it that's unavailable for everybody else. We will. Appropriate time now with Black Friday coming up. You're going to see videos of you know stores opening, doors opening, and people running for that one or two items. That's just think exploitation competition. They are trying to get to that same limiting resource. Interference competition is when you act, have active interference. So exploitation was about being the first to get it, and adaptations are helping you do that. With interference, now what we're trying to do is actively inhibit other organisms from acquiring that resource. So it becomes less important in getting it first or having adaptations at that increases our ability to get it. Now what we're doing is having adaptations that inhibit our competitors from getting it. All right, so if we're gonna have interference competition, we have to be in direct contact. So the bats and, and the, the, the bats and we'll say the birds, they, this is an interference. That's exploitation. They're occurring at different times competing for the same food supply. Interference, you have to have them active at the same time because we have to be interfering with the other's ability to get it. The example in the lab that we did on this was allelopathy. Now, whether or not we had allelopathic effects, that, you know, I think we can have a discussion. I'd say probably not. That some of any of our effects that we observed could have been due to uh, either the water supply or the, the age of our grass seed, perhaps. Right. But we have clear examples of, of allelopathy in nature. So allelopathy is the production and release of chemicals that inhibit the growth of nearby individuals of the same or a different species. Creosote bullet bushes are a great examples. They release compounds, allelopathic compounds, that, that inhibit the growth of other organisms nearby. Some of these compounds will you know, prevent germination. So if you prevent germination, you actively inhibit another species from growing and acquiring the limiting resource. Other allelopathic compounds will inhibit growth rates. Again, you inhibit growth rates, you inhibit root production, you inhibit the other species' ability to get those limiting resources. Others, you produce a compound that's actually toxic to other individuals. So even if they start to grow, they die out fairly quickly. Again, you are interfering with another species' ability to acquire those resources. Antibiotics, why did they develop? Why did, you know, why did they develop? Antibiotics can be, are produced by some bacteria that are out there. Well, they're producing it as a way to interfere with their competitors. If you can prevent others from growing in that area, that means you 
can get those limiting resources. Territoriality. That's interference competition. You set up a territory, you keep others out. You're keeping, you're inhibiting others from getting into your air, your space, and utilizing your resources. Ready for this? All right. We're going to finish up with this slide and then call it a day. Preemptive competition is when we get there first. So it's a mechanism of competition which an individual establishes access to resources by establishing itself and occupying the space. This is going to be specific to plants and other sessile organisms. So organisms that we can't eat. So with preemptive competition, we preempt colonization of other species. And we do so by being there first. Plants get there, you've got defined spaces, a dandelion lands right here, germinates, starts growing. It prevents another plant from growing in that space. That's preemptive competition. Also with the plants, we have shading that occurs. So in forests, the canopy itself prevents competition or prevents uh, others from growing underneath it because it it's the first to capture the light prevents light from reaching the understory. So it's not just about the space, but it's also about the resource as it ex expands its, its canopy. Then we also see diffuse competition. Diffuse competition is a sum defect of all of the competitors. So we can go out into the grass, into the quad. We can look at the plants, find, find one that's, that's particularly diverse in its weeds. We can look at the competition between individual species. We'll pick one, we'll, we'll say dandelion. And we measure competition between the dandelions and every other weed species in that plot. What we might determine is that the competitive effect is actually very mild. Our adjustment with competition is very, very small. And that's for each one, for each competitor. The effect is very small on the day. But collectively, when we have all of these different competitors, maybe now our dandelion population has a much, much lower equilibrium population size, the carrying effects. So individually, competition is pretty low, but once we take into effect all competitors, we get a major effect. That's our diffuse competition. That is our diffuse competition. So it's not just looking at a single individual and single competitor. We also have to be aware that out in a community, you have competition among multiple species for all the various limiting resources. So for our plants, it's not just about space. You can have a competitor for space. You can have a competitor for light. You can have a competitor for water, a competitor for, for nitrogen, a competitor for phosphorus. You can have five different competitors that you are competing with for Whatever limiting resource is between you two, the overall effect is that diffuse competition. All right? Questions? All right, quiz should be fairly easy. The Thanksgiving gift. So go ahead. You got three minutes to take it. Should be very obvious. the correct answer.
take it. That's it for today. Uh, we're going to pick this up with uh, intensity of competition to end results of competition. We're going to introduce the idea of the, the niche, um, talk about character displacement, um, and then we should probably finish this up on Monday. Uh, so start reviewing. If we don't finish this up on Monday, we, we'll kind of wrap it up on Wednesday. Uh, and then what we can do is answer questions on Wednesday and Friday. So that Friday, uh, we'll just meet here. Bring your questions that you may have. We can answer them here in class. What's it? Oh, yeah, the IDA. Yeah, that, I would, I, yeah, the IDA forms. I, I, I forgot about that. Yep, that's. Uh, uh, yeah, I can look at that. Get to see what I see. Uh, I just lag. IDEA form. It is. This is on my end. So we are at a 42% response rate. So yeah, I can't see who has taken it. All I can see is that we have 74 enrolled students. Our current result rate is 42%. Results aren't available until 14th, which is after grades are due. So yeah, you've got 12 days remaining. Ends at 12 slash three, so that's, I think, Friday. So we'll check it out. We're at 42%, not quite there yet. But, uh, if, you haven't, if you've taken it, thanks. If you haven't, uh, please take it. And we'll take a look at it. You, you might just have to remind me to look at it. All right, we're good. Uh, if you're traveling, have a safe trip. We'll reconvene on Monday. And if you wonder, there is no lab this week. You're free to sit in the lab this week if you want. I won't be there. I don't think Dr. Skipper will be there. I can make Michaela be there if you want. No lab. All right.